Uh, thanks to all the witnesses for being here. Ms. Schreier, thank you for being here. And I want to start with you. Uh, you have written at some length about the effect of this act, the potential for this act to affect uh, girls' opportunities in sports and women's sports from young ages when they are girls to all the way up to, uh, to uh, when they're women competing at, at the Olympic level. And you interviewed recently Olympic track and field coach Linda Blade, and you asked her what this would mean for girls' and women's sports. And I'm quoting now from your piece on this, finished, done, is what Linda Blade said. The leadership skills, all the benefits society gets from letting girls have their protected categories so that competition can be fair, all the advances of women's rights, that's going to be diminished, end quote. Tell, tell us about that. Why, why is it that women's sports, women's opportunities in athletics, the opportunities of, of young girls to compete uh, on, a, on a fair and equal basis will be so severely impacted by this law? Sure. So um, thank you, Senator. So the, um, for instance, you know, the great American Allison Felix, great American sprinter, uh, ran the 400 meter in 49.26 seconds. And in 2018, nearly 300 high school boys could beat her. So what that means is America would never know the name Allison Felix. All those girls who look up to her, um, the majority of American female CEOs who believe that their athletic experience gave them the strength and encouragement and the standard of excellence that they brought into their later life that, that began, began in athletics. They would never have that. Um, we, we can go across sports. Um, Venus and Serena Williams in their prime, and I believe it was 1998, um, challenged anyone outside the top 203, 200 uh, male tennis players to a game, and number 203 in the world, and the man beat them handily, both six to one and six to two the other. So we would never know the names, Venus and Serena Williams, and then, of course, none of the girls below them either. You say in your, in your recent, uh, some of your recent writing on this, that uh, parents of teenage girls are generally uninterested in watching their daughters demoralized by the blatant unfairness of a rigged competition. I, I imagine that, that that reflects the views of many parents, but just, just say rigged is a, is a strong word. Why, why is it rigged? Why would the competition be rigged for, for young girls because of these changes? Because the biological changes that occur in mass, male puberty are vast. You're talking about vastly greater upper body strength, lower body strength, um, far more fast twitch muscle fiber, um, larger lungs, larger hearts, more oxygenated blood, all things that give them a massive and permanent advantage in strength and speed. Now, give, let me give you an opportunity to respond uh, to the argument made on by advocates of this law, and I, I think by some of the witnesses here today. Uh, Mr. David, I think, said uh, just a few minutes ago that the Equality Act would not create a new reality for women's sports, that there would be no significant changes, uh, that that things would remain essentially as they are. I mean, what, what's your what's your take on that? Why, why, if he's wrong, why is he wrong? My take is that all the questions seem to suppose that girls can take it. They can give up a few trophies. Come on. They can handle the risk. Except that it is only one group that's asked to bear this risk. It is always women and girls. No boys will suffer because biological girls enter their sports, but girls will lose material opportunities. So in other words, the, the risk and the harm you're saying falls disproportionately on women and maybe in particular disproportionately on younger girls who are, who are just entering sports, uh, who are trying to get, as you said, that, that experience, uh, trying to get uh, those leadership opportunities. They're the ones who would be disproportionately harmed. That's, that's what you're saying. Yes, that's correct. Um, let, Ms. Hassan, just in the few minutes that I have remaining, let me ask you about the effects of this law for religious institutions, which some of my colleagues have pointed out. Now, I was interested to hear a, a colleague of mine on the Democrat, uh, Democrat side say just a moment ago that this law makes no changes to the Religious Fre Freedom Restoration Act and, in fact, has no effect on RIFRA, does not repeal RIFRA, and is not a carve-out. Now, maybe I can't read the text, but my understanding is there is an explicit carve-out in the Equality Act for RIFRA. In other words, it, it, RIFRA is explicitly does not apply any longer under the Equality Act to any of the, the ter any any of the behavior, any of the regulations, anything covered by the act, I'm aware of no other law that seeks to shred RIFRA in this way. And the effect of it basically is is that churches, religious ministries, Christian colleges and universities, 
they'll be unable to pursue their missions, particularly if they involve service to the poor, service to the needy. I mean, tell us about the, the significance of what this bill does when it comes to completely upending decades of religious liberty protections for uh, religious organizations of all kinds. Well, I, I think there was a little bit of, um, uh, I don't know, the language used that this does not change RIFRA. Well, it's true, it's not amending RIFRA, but what it's doing is, is saying you can't use it, you can't uh, have recourse to it. So the Equality Act specifically in the text of the law expressly abrogates the use of RIFRA with regard not just to Title VII, but Title II, Title VI, uh, the entire chapter of federal law. And so this has huge ramifications. So it's, I don't know, disingenuous or, or something to say, well, it's not changing RIFRA, it's just taking it out of reach and saying you cannot use it to anything that uh, where this law is being applied. For I just want to end. I just want to end, Mr. Oh, Chairman, by, by just oh, noting that uh, Reverend Matthew Harrison, the president of the, of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, based in my state, that's a denomination with two million members, has written that this bill puts an ultimatum to individuals, religious nonprofits, food banks, schools, charities, adoption agencies, and others, change your faith-based practices or face government punishment. And I've heard the same from leaders of the Missouri Baptist Convention and other denominations across my state this is a radical attack on religious freedom, and I think uh, it, it's something that we've got to be clear about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.